Before her face was disfigured by hired goons, Linda Risk was very attractive. Linda had taken amphetamines as a supplement and dieted to sculpt herself into a curvy size six. Her eyes were milky blue. Her dark hair was curled back from her face. And at 21, she could usually be seen in sleek, sleek dresses or off-the-shoulder sweaters. Fashionable, dark-haired, and young, like an East Bronx Liz Taylor. If it sounds gross for us to sexualize Lynn in this way, it very much is. But we have a point to make here. These are all the direct quotes from news articles, documentaries, or Lynn herself about her attractiveness in 1959, just before three attackers threw lie in her eyes, leaving her scarred for life and almost entirely blind. The man who hired the goons to blind her, Bert Pugash, had sexualized Linda to the point of obsession. Bert was 32, and he already had a wife and daughter, but he pursued Linda nonetheless. Bert sent Linda flowers, took her on fancy meals in the Latin Quarter, and he flew her around in his single-engine plane. Bert was smitten. When Linda finally found out about Bert's wife, she asked him to file for a divorce. When he refused, Linda broke things off. Then she got engaged to another man. Bert didn't take this well. Bert told her, quote, If I can't have you, no one else will have you. And when I get through with you, no one else will want you. He made good on his threat too, using his money as a lawyer to hire the men who would maim her. Burr would let her be convicted of mastermind the attack and spent 14 years in prison where he would write obsessively to Linda, penning flowery love letters, telling Linda how attractive she is and how he would marry her when he got out of prison. What a lunatic, right? Except if you kept up with the tabloids of the 1970s, you know where this is going. Linda, with her one good eye, saw how fit Bert was getting in prison. She told friends and newspapers she found him much more attractive with a bit of meat on him. And when Bert got out of jail, she took him up on the marriage proposal. Linda married the man that blinded her. You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, the extrovert. And I'm the writer, researcher, and introvert, Joe Anthony, whose job it is to dig through the outer layer of no duh on the internet and get us to the juicy facts. Physical attraction is a funny thing. We all want to look better, to knock people's socks off when we enter a room. But at the same time, ridiculously good-looking people become targets of jealousy and anger. And according to the BBC, being too good-looking can make people judge you as less competent. Because we all assume if you're attractive, you must have skated through life on those looks. So today we're getting the science of attraction and how much of it is pheromones, how much of it is personal preference, how big of a curse is attractiveness. And to help guide us through this research of attraction, we have three myths to bust. Myth one, physical attractiveness is simple. Women want men with hulking biceps and men want pretty faces and big bust. What's there to figure out? Myth two, why are pretty people meaner than the rest of us? Or are they? And can sitting next to an attractive person on the bus stress you out? Myth three, you're born beautiful or ugly and nothing in your behavior can change how attractive you are. Or can it? But before we get to our myths, I want to walk Joe through the events of Linda Risk's attack. 
just so we're crystal clear on how messed up this relationship gets. So just real quick, Todd, um, have you seen the movie Fight Club? Oh, yeah, I've seen it. Do you remember the scene where um, uh, I think Brad Pitt kisses Ed Norton's hand and then they sprinkle powder on it? Yeah, yeah. And he burns the heck out of him? I've watched that movie like 15 times. Yeah. Well, you would. Now, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't know until this article, but that's lie powder that he's sprinkling on him. So that bubbling, hissing, gross, like like scarring. Yeah, when I saw that lie thing I, like, from the 50s, I think, is that like slip a Mickey in their drink? Is that what people used to do to each other in the good old days? I, I, I think, I don't know about the, 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 the slipping Mickeys, but I, I, I don't think it was popular to throw lie on them and burn them. <laughs> uh, although um, uh, I found out this really did happen a couple of times. Um, uh, there was a, a, a blues singer, a Blind Willie Johnson, and he was blinded by lie. Um, he wrote, um, uh, dark was the night, hard was the ground. And he had lie thrown in his eyes, too. So I guess this was the thing? Like, like the, yeah, if you just wanted to that's gone. horribly maim somebody, you'd hit them with this soap powder? As a young, immature boys, we'd pull girls' hair if we liked them. We didn't throw lie in their eyes. Yeah, I've never had the instinct to, uh, like, like, I like somebody, so I'll blind them forever and scar them. Um, so, so that's what really happened, right? With Linda Riss, like that—that th- that was very serious stuff. It was, and it dismayed her face, so she was, you know, permanently scarred. Um, let me take tell you about Bert. He's an interesting guy. Please, okay. See, at the time, he was a very successful attorney, thirty-one, prime of his life, very married, a kids, a wife, the whole bit. He drove by in a sports car, and he sees Linda. And Joe, he's blinded by love. I mean, he's driving the car off. The, and we, we've all had that attraction to somebody you see, and, and your heart stops, right? He, he pulls over? And talk to her around the street. That's what I did in the old days. You didn't get on friggin' Match.com. And wow. <laughs> you're actually a man. You had to go walk up and say, <laughs> ask him <laughs> out, tell him they're uh, Yeah. The real men back. So he's a hotshot lawyer, lawyer, and he worked on some movie productions. So he... He was, and he had a plane, so he was a, you know, he was a baller back in the day. Wow. I mean, enough of a baller to feel comfortable pulling over your car, I guess, and talking to somebody. Yeah, you're a successful attorney, you got money, you got a plane, you're in the movie business. I'm sure he probably dropped those hints in there. Right. They started their relationship. Linda liked him. She found out he was married. She put her foot down right away and said, I am not going to be the other woman. I'm done with you. And he dumped her. She dumped him right on the spot. Okay, that seems natural reaction. Bert found out she was engaged to another man, and he lost it. He wanted to get control back, and that's what this is about. This isn't about wanting to maim somebody. This is about he's so pretty, he wants her, it to be his property. So if I can't have her, no one can, and no one will want her. That's what that means. He's going to make her ugly so no man wants her. Right, Very the, sick. The ultimate danger of attraction. Yeah. Now, being an attorney, having a family, you think, I always think, we, t- we laugh about this, when people who have lots of things to lose do stupid, stupid things. Right. <laughs> we should think they know better, right? One would imagine. And being an attorney, he knows how serious it is to hire goons and do all this, that you're looking at spending the rest of your life, instead of an attorney, you're going to be on the other side of the law in prison. Right, you're going to be giving prison advice to uh, guys with tats. He goes away for 14 years. Now, he spends all that time flooding her with attention. So she's been traumatized by this. She's been to court. She's had to testify against him. He goes away. And now he's flooding with her attention. And he's treating her how she looked before this accident's happened, how beautiful she is, how much he loves her. Do you remember our prison episodes? Yes. Uh, Hybristophilia. For, for the listeners that haven't heard it, um, what happened is these prisoners get together and they just write for hours and hours every day. So they get really good at it. <laughs> they like writers' room their their letters. Like they collaborate and they they make these amazing letters. So Bert here brainwashed her, to made her feel attractive, and he said, "When I get out of prison, let's give it another try." Wow. And we've we've already spoiled this. She did. She did. 
Damn. Okay. Whew. So do you want to talk about the science of attraction and <laughs> how we get to there? <laughs> Please. Okay. Our, our, our show should... Uh, uh, the Reengineered You is we, we try to justify um, uh, human behaviors and why we do certain things and how we can improve from knowing this. Whenever we hear something like somebody was so attractive, another person blinded them with lie... I always think of that. I'm like, okay, that's the challenge. That's the that's the windmill we're tilting at. The dragon we have to slay is how do we get to there? So we're starting at the beginning. We are starting with here's how the basics of attraction work. How we find each other attractive. How we become attractive to somebody else. And there's a lot of components. Um, uh, we, we talk about getting through the outer layer of no-duh. A lot of this is going to hit stuff that either people are aware of already or that it does sound no job, but it builds into something bigger. It, it builds into Linda Riss. It, it, it builds into um, here's what somebody looks at with the whole package of a person. So first up, the one everyone knows about, pheromones. It, it's, it, we see it get tossed around in pop science. We, we see people on TV talk about it. Um, we're aware of it from watching Discovery Channel. Like, like if you watch a documentary with David Attenborough, they talk animal pheromones and how they signal each other to, uh, you know, to, to be attracted and, and to mate. We do have pheromones. Uh, um, you can't necessarily smell them uh, uh, per se like you're smelling like a, a roast in the oven, but we're aware of it and it, it totally keys us. Like, like we will smell something, to us it will smell good or bad. What you are sometimes picking up on is other human pheromones. So I want to share with you a study, um, uh, just as a, a, an aside, do you think mentally you'd be able to smell someone who is attractive or ugly? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So if you're at the laundromat and you pull someone's, you know, like, like you say a dirty shirt, like if you find it in your, in your laundry, you smell it, you don't think you'd be able to be like, oh, that person's attractive or that person is... Gross, or there's something to be said for perfume, maybe. Maybe okay. It's a very feminine, just yeah. Or just or just having like a girlfriend pick out your deodorant. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're gonna do men and women. We want to be fair. Uh, um, so, in in a pheromone study for men, um, they had uh, women uh, um, trying to uh, detect uh, men's sweaty undershirts. So, like, guys would give over their shirts, and the women would smell them, and then they would rate them on how symmetrical the man was, because symmetrical has a lot to do with our attraction. If you put a mirror in front of somebody's face and one eye is off kilter, <laughs> yeah, like if, if their face oh, is absolutely. skewed or their body and is skewed. micro changes are from someone who's attractive to unattractive. It's not inches. It's yeah. tiny... If, if you ever want to know how much symmetry uh, messes with your brain, how much you're aware of it, um, just take a picture of yourself and compare it to you in the mirror. Seeing, seeing yourself flipped will mess with your mind. Like, it, it, it won't look right. Um, so symmetry means a lot to us. Uh, and the women uh, were able to detect by smell with a creepy amount of accuracy who was symmetrical. So they didn't rate them on attractiveness. They were just able to smell undershirts and, and basically get a, a, a better than um, average grade on how symmetrical a man was. That's even more impressive. It is. It, it is very impressive. Um, same thing, uh, or a similar study, where they, they asked uh, women to wear t-shirts to sleep during uh, their fertile and infertile points during their cycle. And then they asked men to smell their t-shirts and assess which ones they found more pleasant. And overwhelmingly, they judged the shirts worn by fertile women to be more pleasant and more sexy. Well, their subconscious has probably been gathering this information for years. Right, exactly. Like, not only were we probably built for it, but also your subconscious picks up on so much that you're unaware of as far as your senses go. And we're measuring for it and looking for our <laughs> next romantic partner. Right. We, we joked at the beginning of the show that, that, you know, all women are just attracted to big biceps and huge shoulders, and that's it. And we, we just sort of ignore all the other data we get. Um, 
Masculinity is a large factor in attractiveness to men. Um, from a, I'm going to actually uh, quote, um, this is a Huffington Post article, The Strange Science of Attraction, and they have so many good sources. I, I do recommend them as an article. Uh, um, they, they break down attraction very nicely. Uh, but they say, quote, in, in pertaining to masculinity, from an evolutionary perspective, masculinity is basically man's way of advertising good genes, dominance, and a likelihood to father healthier kids. So this also means that um, uh, if genes are your biggest concern, like like if, if, if survival is big for you as a person, as a human, um, that kind of um, masculinity as a survival trait would be more important. Which is why uh, women living in poor environments may actually have a greater preference for masculine men, according to the study. Uh, but women in more developed areas uh, show a preference for more feminine-looking men. And that is from a study from the FACE Research Laboratory, also quoted in this article. Um, so if good genes are important to you, you seek that out. If uh, um, somebody who's more feminine is, is more attractive to you, it may be because you live in a, a more wealthy or more resource-rich uh, uh, area. I also want to talk a, a little bit about um, the, the, uh, the MHC, the, the, um, the histoimmune system. Um, so you've seen, I, I hate to do this, I, I'm, you've seen the movie uh, Back to the Future? <laughs> Yes, I have. <laughs> is yeah. am I remembering correctly? There's a moment where his mom kisses him, yeah, and she says it's weird. He doesn't know it's his mom, <laughs> right? Oh, that's a yeah. This is a, <laughs> I gotta I gotta speak up here because Joe. This is another one of the things Joe talks about more often than most people would. So go ahead, Joe. You don't mean kissing people's <laughs> mothers, do you? Not okay. the mother kissing, but the, 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 the swapping the, spits. Yeah. Now. <laughs> So um, that, that kissing, the, the reason why we do that is we're actually sampling somebody's histoimmune system, their mega histoimmune system. The MHC, uh, um, basically, uh, um, it, if you find somebody with an immune system that when you, you, when you mix your genetic cocktail with somebody else and you make a healthier immune system with kids that can fight off more bacteria, more parasites, more viruses... That's basically the body's main goal in mating. So when you kiss somebody and it's like that back to the future moment where it's like, it's gross. Like, it's like, oh, that's like kissing my sister. It's a science experiment. It's yeah. Not, it's not just foreplay. That's interesting. Your, your mouth is conducting a science experiment and just hoovering uh, 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 the immune system of somebody else to find out if you're going to make good kids. Yeah. So a, a great kisser might be a great dad or a great mom. Right. And gorgeous, tall, healthy kids, smart kids. <laughs> right, exactly. There, there's also um, uh, a field of study where they 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 look at how um, uh, hormone pills, basically uh, pills that change pregnancy cycles, like progesterone, might be affecting the way we sample MHC. So, like, um, uh, women are more prone when they're pregnant to seek out uh, comfort from family. It just it's natural. Like like. During a normal pregnancy cycle, women will try to gravitate towards safer males. Uh, it, it's speaking in like old caveman terms, you may get knocked up by uh, Bubba Cleva, who is just slaying tigers all day, but that's not the guy you want really like comforting you while you're pregnant. You you stay away from the big scary guy that got you knocked up. You go seek out you Makes know sense. family because you're protecting the baby too. You're right, protecting and nurturing and growing mode. Exactly. However, if, if you're on progesterone or something like that, and you've basically your body has been fooled into thinking you're in that cycle all the time, you're less likely to seek out the um, that kind of like alpha male to to mate with at that moment. Like like you may be more prone to be attracted to uh, more feminine men or men that have similar MHCs to you. Um, I really don't want to give people the idea that you're seeking out more feminine men. It is it is that you're more prone to look for people who have similar immune systems or, or immune responses. Um, another point of attractiveness. But they're uh, not Navy SEALs. They don't bunk hut on the weekend every weekend. Right, yeah. <laughs> you won't meet them at Cabela's. You're more likely to meet them downtown at the library. 
Yeah. You you might be on um, one of these hormones they mentioned in the article and go looking for a Navy SEAL, but it's going to be a Navy SEAL that maybe has a similar immune system to your, to your brother. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, another one we look for is averageness. Um, so uh, in these studies that they, they looked at, um, one, of the, one of the better ones that they cited was uh, a study where participants selected 32 faces of women, and they used a computer program to make their features look more average. And you can see this online. I see this pop up on Facebook and, and all kinds of sites that just as a, a fun thought experiment, they show what Angelina Jolie would look like averaged out with other celebrities or averaged out with the population. Um, but they showed uh, photos of these as well as 94 photos of real, real female faces to groups of college students. And um, only four of the photographs of real female faces were rated as more attractive than the averaged face. So generally, we, we are not necessarily looking for the most beautiful person. Yeah, we're more looking for somebody who is uh, symmetrical and average in general. And then finally, um, we can't have an episode about of attractiveness without mentioning how much personal preference uh, falls into this. So if you're if you're sitting at home and you're thinking, I'm not a slave to pheromones, I, I I'm you know I'm going to disobey my my instincts on mega histoimmune system. I don't look for averageness. In fact, I look for unique people. Um, if you're out there looking for David Bowie, basically. Um, <laughs> Then that comes down to personal preference. And um, uh, I found a good quote by uh, Helen Fisher, who was quoted in this article. Uh, she worked on something called love maps. Um, and they kind of dictate or, or determine who individuals gravitate toward. And here's what she said about that. Uh, quote, these love maps vary from one individual to the next. Some people get turned on by a business suit or a doctor's uniform by big breasts, by small feet, by a vivacious laugh. And then she kind of goes on to talk about, you know, what, what not necessarily what it means about you, but that it, it, it's sort of everyone has their own preference. You got a type, and that's okay. We all have our, it's not a prejudice, it's a preference. Exactly. And if that means that you uh, pull over your car, tires screeching to yell at a woman who is on the street, like Linda Riss, then you have found your preference. Try not to throw a lie in her face. <laughs> Excuse me, ma'am. Did you know you're gorgeous? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I've heard that a couple times today already. Right. So I, I, I kind of can't get over that they still ended up together after he got out of prison. Let me tell you the story. So he gets out of prison in 1974. Now I know that year because that's the year I was born. Okay. And they never tried to get away from the spotlight. I mean, it was almost like a press release. They got out, they got right together, they called the newspapers. So they kind of used this as their five minutes of fame forever. Hmm. They lived very humbly. Um, they lived in a little apartment. He was no longer an attorney. I guess you get debarred when you lie people's face and go away to prison. You're a <laughs> that, <laughs> Apparently, they, the New York bar frowns upon that. <laughs> right. That's not just like a tactic you bring to court with you. Like you yeah. sit down with your briefcase in your jar of lye. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so they were always seen together. And they were always teasing each other and holding hands and being kissy-kissy when the camera's around. Um, so if we were to see them in a restaurant, you know, that diner we used to always hang out. We saw a couple over there. We'd say, man, I hope that someday... When I'm, you know, old, I'm with somebody, and we're still in love like that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we, we wouldn't know the backstory. And oh, she's she can barely, she's blind, and he's helping her around. Yeah, because he's the he's the one that did this son of a bitch that did to her. God, can you imagine having that as an argument that you can like? That that's a that's an instant win for an argument, right? Like yeah, like <laughs> anytime he's not doing the dishes, she's like, "Well, you blinded me." <laughs> I was thinking the opposite every time. Yeah, you said, "Do you remember that time?" Yeah. 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 Okay. In my opinion, Bert, and I listened to a whole bunch of his interviews, a lot, he came off to me as extremely arrogant. Okay. With zero shame and zero guilt. Wow. Yeah, and for people like me and people like Bert, we need a little shame or guilt. Okay. <laughs> you know, he, he just kind of thought it was funny. He never felt like bad, like if I could go back and 
no, kind of, kind of. He had the attitude, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. She was the best thing that ever happened to me, but I'm glad I went away. I'm glad that the, everything worked out the way it did. Good God. I thought the story was going toward, like, he made up for it every day of his life, so he just didn't care. He was cocky, arrogant about it, in my opinion. Wow. Now, every time they had an anniversary or a birthday, they would get on the phone and call up the local newspapers. So they kept this story alive. I, it's To me, it's amazing that this was a movie before. I'm surprised I've never heard of this. This is, like, amazing. Huh. It, it's a movie? Yeah, they made it into a documentary movie. It was a big success. But, of course, it would because they've kept this self-promoting this thing their whole life. So do we want to say the name of the movie? Crazy Love. Crazy Love. What I got to go watch that What title, now. right? Yeah, well... It, it was either crazy love or that one time a jerk blinded somebody and then they married him. Like, that, that crazy love fits, I think. Well, I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about uh, my own insecurities a bit, if you're okay with that. Please. I love um, talking about my feelings and insecurities and <laughs> stuff. <laughs> it's nice to see you're coming around. <laughs> I, I, I've... Uh, uh, purposely embarrassed you enough times on this podcast. I just want to reveal uh, a few small things about me. Um, uh, I ride the bus uh, uh, and the train quite often. We live in a metro area. Like it, it's it's that's not bizarre. It, it's the, we have very very frequent service. It's a really good system around our town. Um, Millionaires ride the bus here in Portland. Right, yeah. I, Pre-COVID, you would see everybody on the train. Yeah. I used to think about late at night when, like, the last attractive person leaves the train or the bus. And what's left, especially really late at night, is just, like, the opposite of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Like, it's just everyone <laughs> looks at each other and they're like, well, we're here. Like, this is what we're left with. <laughs> Uh, but I, I kind of reading about Linda Riss and and reading about Bert made me want to know: um, Do attractive people are, are they meaner than everyone? Uh, like, do they? Ha I kind of feel like like if you're really attractive, you kind of look down on people. Yeah, you spit on them like. <laughs> right, and, and I also How dare you talk to me. Yeah, I'm like gorgeous. like like you're born royalty. <laughs> and I also wanted to know if if being attractive made it uh, made people nervous. Like like if I'm sure attractive people would like the supermodels would be like yes of course both those things duh. Uh, but I went looking for the research because I I had to know to what degree. So just because I have to turn everything into a, a guessing game with us. Um, would you guess that more attractive people are, in fact, meaner? Yes. Okay. There's, yeah, a little stuck up. Not all of them. There's some sweet ones. I, I think you're right. And, and that's what my guess was going into this as well. Um, so this comes from a Psychology A Day article uh, where a doctor named Holtzman uh, assembled a team and they started uh, looking at um, something called adorned versus unadorned attractiveness. They wanted to test people um, first by taking pictures of them uh, in what they called an anti-makeover, uh, where they would put them in like simple gray uh, sweat uh, sweatpants, sweatshirts. They would pull their hair back and put it in a uh, tail. They would they would no makeup. D dull them down. Dull them down as plain as possible uh, with just their natural uh, uh, whatever they have going for them uh, men had to remove their beards like it was it was so serious they just they wanted nothing obscuring the face nothing making them look more attractive uh, and what they were testing for is they compared um, their attractive ratings when they were shown to other people and they compared that against um, psych tests they had taken so they had taken tests for um, narcissism uh, uh, psychopathy, Machiavellianism, basically all these are guile. Uh, and they also tested them for extroversion, social uh, uh, agreeableness, enthusiasm, friendliness and kindness. So they really wanted to, um, their, their, their completely natural attractive state rated versus their personalities. So we'd finally know our beautiful people mean. 
They found out there wasn't much of a correlation. A drum roll. <laughs> a drum roll, yes. Um, there wasn't much of a correlation between uh, naturally attractive people and meanness. So attractive people are not necessarily mean. However, they're sk- <laughs> adorned attractiveness is a th- uh, uh, um, is represented or at least correlated with um, uh, one of the the dark triad as they put it um, specifically uh, psychopathy um, so they were able to take the data and they found correlations that uh, associated with adornment so basically people um, who dress up to look good who who put a lot of effort into making themselves look more attractive uh, who did not score highly in the naturally attractive rating but adorned themselves well apparently if you spend that much time on your looks then you may have some uh, amount of uh, psychopathy in you um, again that's the, the the stuff that came with the guile test that was uh, psychopathy narcissism and machiavellianism the, the difference between the natural beauty inside out and the store-bought beauty inside and out that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, the the, the store bought beauty, the beauty aisle beauty. That's that's it showed more signs of um, psychopathy in that. Well, I have to share a personal story. I was spooked by a woman once, and as you know, Joe, I'll talk to anybody. Yeah, and I was at yoga class, and I'd known this this woman, and she was stunning. I had never talked to her before, and I'd seen her in class, and I of course noticed her. And there's a point of the class every once in a while they say, "Well, introduce yourself to somebody new." And she came over and to introduce herself to me, and I got spooked and ran out of the and went to the bathroom. <laughs> wow! Okay, I couldn't even say my name, so I was so. And I, again, I think it's the insecurity of yeah, you know, having that spotlight on me in front of her. I just wasn't ready for it. Right, I, I sympathize with that. Um, and have you ever ran out on something like that? Uh, not just one you you your story is uh, yoga class yeah no um uh, no every time not not just once it's, it's every, every time. friday night <laughs> every friday night um it's scary i do okay so i'm gonna reveal too much about myself yet again uh i, I do something that we're about to to find out uh in this article there's a small percentage of people who, um, when you see a beautiful face, and, and I'm going to uh, hearken to a, a, an Atlantic article, uh, how attractive people make you feel, uh, or how, how attractive people affect your brain. They talk about this effect where attractive people who are, are absurdly attractive, if they go near you, you get a, a dopamine kick. It's like seeing a beautiful painting. Your, your brain is like, oh, here's some dopamine. Here's a reward for seeing this person who's very attractive. Maybe you should go talk to them. And on rare occasions, attractive people can make you feel less than. So if you go to see the doctor and you are sick, that's, this is the example they use in this Atlantic article, that if you're sick and you feel bad and you look bad and you're bedraggled and you're, you barely got out of bed with the flu to make it to the doctors, and then a very attractive nurse or doctor comes in, it's unfair. Like, like... Like they're putting it on you to look, you know, to, to look up to their standard, to, to, to look better. They're put together. They're ready for work. And you are, you know, you're dying. <laughs> um, you're this lump of meat. Right. So I feel that way on the bus <laughs> or, or just just generally. Um, I, I take it. Uh, uh, um, uh, I hold it against people is, is the way to put it. And this article backs this up. So I don't feel nearly as bad sharing this anymore. Um, but I get that initial dopamine. And then what I get is uh, I get cortisol to balance it out. So I get the dopamine of, hey, there's an attractive person. And then the stress kicks in. And then the stress kicks in. Cortisol kicks in to say, oh, buddy, you, know, you, are, you, are, you are not uh, uh, ready for this. And then, and then I, I take it, I hold it against people. So um, if they're looking at us, then we play this measuring, judging game. Oh, they're they're looking at me like of what I'm wearing or right. where I work or what I am or right. If if you feel like you're less than, then you feel like you're being judged. Um, and so I've I've told you before that I use my intellect as a shield. That's exactly when I do it. It's it's when um, I feel like I'm being potentially judged. I I 
I use my intelligence as a bludgeon. So if they ask me questions, I will oftentimes fire back with jokes that are borderline. I was going to say cruel, but I'm not a cruel person. I, I usually just come back with, you know, fun jokes that, that are... You're a kind person. You yeah, are. but they're they're designed to, to um, let people know that I can be sharp. So... Um, and I'm very, very glad reading this article to know I'm not alone in that. That that's actually a pretty natural response to to being unpreparedly surprised with someone who's beautiful. Your yoga story sounds much better than mine, by the way. I ran to the bathroom. <laughs> All I had to say was, "It's nice to meet you." My name's Todd. <laughs> I, I, what a punk! What a punk! <laughs> I think I think you did fine. You did not throw lie in her face, so I'm 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 proud. So, um, did you actually end up seeing the movie Crazy Love, the the I, one about I, Linda Riss? No, I haven't seen it, but I'm well read on this couple. Okay, did it do well the the movie? It did. You know, this was not like the documentaries nowadays with Netflix and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I would, would be surprised if someday this isn't a major motion picture. This is just too good a story. Yeah. Um, so the director, th this is, okay, this is one of those stories that if you heard it in a fictional book or movie, you'd say, that's unrealistic. Right. That would never happen in real life. Um, but... They were always hamming it up for the media. They were the constant PR people. So this director found, I mean, this is, um, these are marketing savages, right? Right. <laughs> you don't usually get people. So not only were they willing to sign off on anything to make a buck, they just enjoyed the fame of it. You mentioned they, they called the newspapers when they had birthdays and stuff. And anniversaries, because this couple is still together. Right. And so they've been on TV for years. Now you got to keep in mind this was pre-reality TV in these years. So nowadays, if they were around, they would have their own show, okay. guaranteed. Because okay. Bert was such a loud mouth, you know, jerk off, and then she dresses up real fancy, and she's she's an actress of type, so. That would be so much darker than, like, the Osbournes or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Real, real bad guys. Right. Oh, okay, Joe. This is my problem. I'm going to be honest with you as we're sharing. This is a safe space. My face is not completely symmetrical. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I don't think, I don't have the money <laughs> or the means to move it around and make it more symmetrical. So how can I be more attractive? That is the the money question. That that's um, when we started this episode. I almost felt like putting that as like uh, our our biggest header. Our only myth is how do we be more attractive? Um, and so we we save this for last. We wanted to tease it. How do we become more attractive? And we're gonna we're gonna give it out for men and women. Um, so these come from uh, uh, bar studies. I love scientists, by the way, because they are willing to study the craziest, weirdest stuff. Um, you will find studies about people like like looking at the tilt of people's hip to see what the best you know like butt ratio is. Yeah, forget about cures for diseases. Let's talk about some real science that we can use. I, I remember reading about uh, um, um, they have um, uh, an Ig Nobel Prize where they give out prizes for scientists that study the weirdest stuff. It's always delightful. <laughs> this almost falls into the same category. Joe calls those heroes. They are. Oh, the, the, <laughs> there's a duck study where like one scientist observed for 40 minutes a duck having uh, uh, intercourse with a dead duck. Like It was uh, awful. <laughs> yeah, go check out those prizes someday. But these These almost sounded so simple, they sounded like an Ig Nobel. Like They sounded like if it weren't so helpful, it would fall into the ridiculous category. So they followed men and women to bars and, and taverns, and they wanted to see what can people do to actually appear more attractive. And uh, it was based on, um, uh, did they get a phone number? Uh, did they get someone to approach them? And how much attention, uh, meaning how many seconds worth of attention did somebody get? And what they had to do to do it. And they have control groups. They really did science this up. They, That's they all had... measurable stuff. Oh, totally. Yeah. So um, when I make fun of them, it's more just like because it's so simple that, that anytime you have scientists going to a bar, it's not usually for drinks or not always for drinks. 
Um, so the men who went to the bars, uh, they, they took these study groups and they found out that women were um, three times more likely to give out their phone number to men who told jokes compared to men who did not tell jokes. And I think they pre-planned the jokes out. I think they gave them basically stock jokes. Um, but they, they interviewed and, and tested the women afterward. And they found out that the men uh, who told jokes, who were humorous, were also considered more attractive, more intelligent, more funny, more sociable. Um, even though uh, only the last of those two were statistically um, significantly had, had differences in them. We've talked on this show about how um, intelligence is basically, or, or um, funniness, humor, is a brain hack. Like it signals to everyone around you that you're intelligent and socially aware. And those two things put together mean, in our modern world, survival. Uh, they mean that if you find someone funny who demonstrates both those things, it's very important. They're smart, they'll have a good job. Yes. And if they're socially aware, it means they're more likely to have more money throughout their life and be able to engage with your social network, which is very important. And they'll be nice to you. They'll make you laugh, cheer you up. Right. Now, how can women be more attractive? Um I, I almost feel like like one of those like uh, this one weird trick like we're a BuzzFeed article or a clickbaity article. So be real careful on how you answer this. <laughs> <laughs> Hell hath no fury. Like. Right. <laughs> we're we're about to be canceled, Todd. Um, th- according to this study, uh, that isn't me. It's it's on Psychology Today. Um, it's to smile. Um, I, I know that uh, um, men telling women to smile is a, a, uh, a potentially a hot button, that, that it's, it's sort of an aggressive move and it sends the wrong signal. Um, instead, what I'm saying is, in this study, women who smiled at men, it signaled to them interest. Um, so I'm going to quote the article. Um, Average-looking female confederates who went into a bar and made eye contact with a guy sitting alone... In half the cases, she smiled toward him, and in the other half, she didn't. The decision whether to smile or not was random. 100 men participate in the study. When the women smiled, the number of men who approached her was five times more compared to the men who didn't. Holy cow, big big difference. It's 11 to 2. It's a huge difference. Uh, Even if the men did not approach the women, the men who got a smile glanced at the woman for seven seconds uh, as opposed to only two when they did not. So it's a huge attention getter, too. Massive. Um, So it it may not physically change the shape of your face or make you more attractive, but it is a damn big signal. And and like men that used humor, um, it it got them the numbers. So what we're really pointing out here, and this is the irony to me, is we start the, the this whole episode, we talk about how there's all these components to attractiveness. But the ones that you can control are the biggest ones that make a difference. And it really comes down to personality. Smile and be humorous. (laughs) Now, we know from uh, our last episode, Lisa Nowak and Romantic Obsession, that science can help. uh, That you can, they can use sort of cues. I mean, there's so many articles about like how to be more attractive, wear red. Uh, take pictures of yourself with dogs. If you're a man, have a, a <laughs> asymmetrical scar on your face somewhere. Like there's so many sort of BS articles telling you how to be more attractive. Um, but in the Lisa Nowak episode, we we talked about how um, everybody in social dating, in online dating, um, everyone starts out shooting out of their league by about 20 percent, and then they adjust later. So just remember that when when you're when you're dating or when you're approaching somebody, um, you get to control uh, the signals of your attractiveness through smiling and through humor. And it's totally okay to shoot out of your league and your chances will be slightly better if you do have a smile or a joke. And it shows your interest too. Right. Yeah, you don't have to be too serious, too cool. <laughs> you can tell jokes and be fun and smile. You don't have to be so serious. Right. And if you show up with three thugs, then then it's an attention getter 
Why do they need three goons for this job? Anyway? I don't know. I was wondering <laughs> yeah, that. It's a four-man job to throw some dust on someone's face? Imagine being one of the guys that wasn't holding that jar of lye. Like, like imagine being one of the thugs. I know I don't want to. That's kind of gross. But <laughs> but think about looking at your buddy and being like, what do you do with that jar, man? Oh, exactly. And you're, you're, these guys were some goons. I guarantee it. Hopefully right. they never got out of jail. Right. <clears throat> so... How did things work out for, for Lyndon Burt in the end? Well, this has been a personal lesson to me. And, and the big one being for me, Joe, is my thoughts on forgiveness. Now, I can't always forgive people for little things that I've been slighted on. So what I can say now from all this research is what would Linda do? She would forgive them. <laughs> she would love them. I mean, to the point of make love to them and marry them. Right. That's a level of forgiveness I don't think I can get to. I mean, most families, when something embarrassing happens in the family, what do we do? We bury it in the backyard, and we never <laughs> speak of it again. Not in this family. They made a public spectacle of it for over 33 years. Right. We need shame and guilt back in this world. You know? <laughs> You know, there's a reason I wrote grudges as an episode before we ever got to this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Mr. Pugash got in trouble again. Um, he had a sexual abuse trial, and he had threatened to kill a woman, and this was in 1997. Now, Linda took the stand in his defense. He was found guilty, but he only got 15 days in jail. Wow. So to the end, even though he did something bad, and I'm not here to judge him on another thing, but he does have a history of violence against women. Right. And if he was out for those other 15 years, who knows what else we got into. But she still stood up, stood up for him. She ended up dying of a heart attack before him. And she was just strong-willed and loyal, in my opinion, to a fault. I think she could have done better. I do believe she was truly in love with her husband. And if given the offer again, I think she would take it. I think she would take being main, take being blinded, taking this weird life for all that attention that she got. I think that attention was a really burning desire and a huge value to both of them. Wow. Now, if, okay, so this is, I, I can't stop asking di dark hypotheticals. If I... If the trade was, I threw lie in your face, but you got everything in life you ever wanted, would you take it? Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got a lot of things I want. It's an open check. No. No. Okay. I'm <laughs> glad you get said most that. of them and be able to see and being handsome like I am now. Right. I might not be symmetrical, but my hands are still pretty fit, <laughs> pretty handsome. <laughs> I'll ask you about the lie when you're like 70 or 80. We'll come back to this later. <laughs> Have you ever seen the ads? For Axe Body Spray? Commercials where a man sprays himself with a magic can of pheromones. And suddenly, women can't keep their hands off him. Don't we treat our own attractiveness like that? If we just lost a bit of weight, we'd be more attractive. If we just wore the right dress, got the right haircut, drove the right car, that would finally redline us on the attractiveness gauge. In reality, attractiveness comes down to a lot of different factors. And while pheromones is one of those factors, we also have to consider immune system compatibility, genes, symmetry, averageness, and above all, personal preference. We all want to be attractive, but attractive people can make us feel uncomfortable, less than. And attractive people can seem unnecessarily mean if you find yourself sitting next to someone that's so beautiful, it makes you feel like a slob. Remember, it's not about us. It's our reaction to feeling put on the spot. It's your brain's natural defense against being charmed. Unless their supernatural attractiveness is just an adornment, then maybe they're a sociopath. Either way, there seems to be a universal way to boost whatever attractiveness you already have. And here it is. Men, you need to get funny. Women, smile. But only if you feel like it. But whichever you do to boast your attractiveness, just remember, 
It's a better plan then. Splash lie in their face. Get Buff in prison. And wage a decades-long psychological war against them. That may be taking attraction a little too far. You've been listening to The Re-Engineered You. Thank you so much for listening to the show. You mean the world to us. We have a new episode every week. You can connect with us at www.re-engineeredu.com where we have research links, show notes, and blog articles for each of our episodes. We also appreciate feedback. We love spirited debate. And if you send us lie, <laughs> well, don't do that. We'll throw it at someone we don't like. <laughs> We're not experts in anything, but we've got an opinion on everything. Thank you.